Good morning and welcome to Worship of the Living God, the online worship experience of United Church of Chapel Hill. We're so grateful that you have gathered with us this morning on this, the first Sunday of the Lenten season. We invite you to accompany us through the rest of this 40-day journey of reflection and prayer as we make our way to the cross and ultimately to the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. We are so grateful for your willingness to be with us. There are so many programs and possibilities for connection throughout this 40-day season, and we invite you to pay close attention to what's shared in the edus in the days ahead. But for now, let us join our hearts together for worship of the living God. Good morning. Our Old Testament lesson is from Genesis chapter 9, verses 8 through 17. Then God said to Noah and to his sons with him, As for me, I'm establishing my covenant with you and your descendants after you, and with every living creature that is with you, the birds, the domestic animals, and every animal of the earth with you, as many as came out of the ark. I established my covenant with you, that never again shall all flesh be cut off by the waters of a flood, and never again shall there be a flood to destroy the earth. God said, this is the sign of the covenant that I make between me and you and every living creature that is with you for all future generations. I have set my bow in the clouds and it shall be a sign of the covenant between me and the earth. When I bring clouds over the earth and the bow is seen in the clouds, I will remember my covenant that is between me and you and every living creature of all flesh and the waters shall never again become a flood to destroy all flesh. When the bow is in the clouds, I will see it and remember the everlasting covenant between God and every living creature of all flesh that is on the earth. God said to Noah, this is the sign of the covenant that I have established between me and all flesh that is on the earth. Our gospel lesson today is from Mark chapter 1, verses 9 through 15. In those days, Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. And just as he was coming up out of the water, he saw the heavens torn apart and the spirit descending like a dove on him. And a voice came from heaven, you are my son, the beloved, with you I am well pleased. And the spirit immediately drove him out into the wilderness. He was in the wilderness for 40 days, tempted by Satan, and he was with the wild beasts and the angels waited on him. Now after John was arrested, Jesus came to Galilee, proclaiming the good news of God and saying, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe in the good news. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let's pray together. Dear God, let some word that is heard be yours. Amen. There's nothing quite like randomly receiving a physical letter in the mail. One of the few things I know to rival it is taking the time to write and send one yourself. In a world where communication has been reduced to rushed emails and abbreviated emoji-filled text messages, even a short handwritten note conveys so much. It's humbling to know that someone would take the time to sit down and think about you long enough to write it down, to put it to paper. And for so many out there, like our dear Jeff Hall, such notes are a cultivation of gratitude, an expression of love, even a word of prayer. It's a spiritual practice, and for those of you who are still searching for a Lenten discipline, go and buy yourself a pack of cards and write to those that you love and miss. In these socially distant times, it is really a life-giving point of connection. But just remember, nothing ruins the sheer joy of finding a letter in the mail, like carefully opening the envelope, pulling out the card, and discovering that it's covered in glitter. I mean, really, I would love to find the Hallmark executive who thought that glittered cards were a good idea. Look, I mean, I'll give them this. It certainly takes those few minutes of joy, 
reading your card and stretches it into days and days of sparkling reminders that Aunt Cindy remembered your birthday. Now, I know what some of you might be thinking, but Ian, don't you have a history in children's ministry? Yes, yes, I do. And glitter and glue were the bane of my existence. <laughs> but Ian, didn't you bring glitter ashes with you from your church in New York as a queer affirming liturgical practice for our community? Yes, yes, I did. And I brought along with it all of my existential and theological uncertainties. It's true, I did bring glitter ashes to United Church with a little more trepidation than not. The first year I even forgot to order them on time. After running to some craft supply store, I rushed into the kitchen and pulled Lori Carter, God bless her, to help me mix up glitter ash and oil in the 10 minutes right before the Ash Wednesday service began. The hilarity of that blessed mess is still one of my favorite memories at United Church, and it's a point of connection that Lori and I will always share. And that alone may have made the glitter ashes worth it. But honestly, nothing can beat the look on Selah and Simon and Ava's faces. The sheer joy and anticipation of the kids lining up to receive an imposition of glittery ashes was enough for me to justify the practices in the years ahead. But I did often wonder if it's just a little too kitschy, a distraction from the introspection, penitence, and posture of confession that we undertake in this season. So I took my concerns to one of my dearest and queerest friends, our own Joey Honeycutt. As a hospice chaplain, Joey questioned whether the practice was really just another way that our culture evades reckoning with the reality of death a concern that we've theologized over many, many times. These are important questions, I think, and not just about glitter ashes, but they raise questions about this season of Lent in particular. I mean, it already feels like we've been in the wilderness for about a year now. Do we really need to undertake practices of self-denial in 2021 when there's little more that we could find to even give up? Do we lean in to face our mortality even as the specter of death seems to linger everywhere? Do we still posture ourselves humbly in acceptance of our finitude when everything in our lives already seems so certainly outside of our control? Yes. Yes, and we turn to face the ash and dust because they throw in sharp relief that which shimmers just beneath the surface of our lives. For it is only God's grace that sustains us on this journey from dust to dust. And if we look close enough into the ashes that mark us, we can see it sparkling there. Maybe that dogged and vexing persistence of the glitter has something to teach me after all. You see, these ashes, they mark us for a mission. Affirmed in our divine belovedness, we follow Jesus into the baptism of water. Driven then by the Spirit, we follow Jesus into the baptism of fire. Covered then in ash, we follow Jesus into the wilderness. And ultimately, we emerge from this journey ready to proclaim liberative, life-affirming good news. And listen clearly, church. In this Lenten wilderness, we do not mimic death. Whatever practices we undertake in this season should never be instruments of trauma or pain or harm for ourselves or for those who undertake this journey alongside us. We follow Jesus into the wilderness not to mimic death, but to learn how to resist its temptations, to look deeply at what makes life truly worth living. In this season, we work to distinguish what is death-dealing from what is life-giving, even within our own scripture, even in the liturgical practices that we undertake, like this one in the season of Lent, even in institutions like United Church of Chapel Hill. We separate our fragile earthen vessels from the treasure of the gospel, the good news that they hold. 
This is what the Lenten journey is all about. Together we look unflinchingly into the ash of our world to see what divine possibilities glitter within. We reckon deeply with the dust that bookends our existence to see more clearly the grace that animates us, the divine love that calls us into right relationship with one another. And within our own hearts, we come ready to separate that which is God's provision from that which is merely the privilege we carry. Just a couple of weeks ago, Reverend Lashana Austria came and spoke to many of us on the theme of liberation in the land. As a black woman raised in rural Alamance County, Lashana has returned to her roots and begun leading her community in conversations about agriculture and food systems. Digging in the dirt alongside them, what she didn't expect to uncover were the roots of deep trauma in this community's relationship with the land. At the beginning of this journey, an elder came to Lashana and said, look, why would we want to do anything on the land the way our people have been treated on it historically? Lashana didn't have an answer, but she turned compassionately toward the pain underneath that question, and she committed to working with her people to find an answer. That was just one of the many such conversations and Bible studies that happened as a result of Lashana's ministry. These were difficult conversations, but ones sustained by prayer and loving relationship. We can see now, Lashana said to our group, that this is not what the land did to us. This is what people did to us. Going back to the land has been a liberating act of resistance because my people were not meant to thrive on the land and have been stripped of the goodness of God's creation. They were made to suffer and to be made to believe that the land was not for them to thrive on. So for me, going back is an act of liberation. It's a beautiful story, and Lashana's full reflections are available for anyone who may want to go back and listen to them. But as I listened that evening, bearing witness to the pain of her community that she felt safe enough to name in this space, I began to interrogate the privilege through which I perceived the blessing of the land. Of course the land is a gift from God, I would have said before hearing the story that Lashana shared with us. Of course a return to the land is good for all of us and for the sustainability of our planet. But as well-intentioned as they may be, my environmental commitments cannot ignore the trauma of others. They cannot eradicate the history that my people have with the land and that her people have with this land. If I am to claim that the liberation of Lashana and her community is bound to my own, I must first commit myself to good news, which is truly good for all who hear it. And in order for my heart to be a vessel for that kind of radical, revolutionary, transformative love, I will have to pursue a world where my own privilege and power are first reduced to ash. Otherwise, I might miss the grace glittering beneath a story like this one. On this Lenten journey, we are marked for a mission to proclaim and pursue the world that Christ told us is possible. So this Lent, may we proclaim and pursue a world where we trade in a healthcare system centered on profit for one rooted in healing. May we proclaim and pursue a world where public safety isn't defined by violence and punishment, but reconciliation and redemption. May we proclaim and pursue a world where queer liberation isn't limited to marriage equality for white elites, but for the protection and thriving of black trans women, homeless youth, and sex workers. May we proclaim and pursue a world where the wealth of corporate shareholders isn't valued above the dignity of warehouse workers and janitors. May we proclaim and pursue a world where global health disparities don't leave the wealthiest nations vaccinated while this pandemic endures for the poorest and most dispossessed. No, in Lent, we turn toward the suffering within us and the suffering around us not to reduce ourselves to an ash heap of guilt, but to be attentive to the possibilities that flash into view as the light catches them. 
Here is a story to break your heart, Mary Oliver writes. Are you willing? I tell you this to break your heart, by which I only mean that it break open and never close again to the rest of the world. Compassion, friends, is omnidirectional and abundant. The more I offer to you, the more I have for myself and vice versa. This willingness to turn toward and sit with the pain of our world is at the root of Christ's ministry and our calling. It is true, we are marked for this mission by ash and dust, but we are also marked by the grace that glitters within it. And believe me, based on personal experience, the glitter will stick around for much, much longer than the ashes. So let's journey with Jesus into the refining fire of this wilderness journey. May all that is less than God's intention for this world be reduced to ash and dust, and may we remain attentive to the grace that glitters in the meantime. For Christ's kingdom shimmers among us, even now. Oh, and on second thought, should you decide to mail off a card this Lent, make sure that it has plenty of glitter. I think we could all use a little more sparkle in our lives. Amen. As we begin the season of Lent, we join with the psalmist in this prayer for cleansing and for pardon. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your steadfast love. According to your abundant mercy, blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. Against you, you alone have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight, so that you are justified in your sentence and blameless when you pass judgment. Indeed, I was born guilty, a sinner when my mother conceived me. You desire truth in the inward being. Therefore, teach me wisdom in my secret heart. Purge me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Let me hear joy and gladness. 
Let the bones that you have crushed rejoice. Hide your face from my sins and blot out all my iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and put a new and right spirit within me. Let us pray together as Christ Jesus has taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Friends, let us go forth on this Lenten journey together in peace, following the words of Jesus to love one another, always seeking to be led by the Spirit, doing justice, loving kindness, and walking humbly with our God. Amen. Amen.